Hello and welcome to this, the second season of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and if you're brand new to the old Frame and Reference, this is a cinematography based podcast. Uh, for the first season, I was only speaking to cinematographers, but now going into season two, I've decided to widen the landscape a little bit and speak to, you know, production designers, directors, colorists, other people who have influence on the overall look of the film. Uh, this will still be a cinematography focused podcast. So when I talk to those people, we will be talking about, you know, how they interacted with the cinematographers, um, what those relationships looked like, uh, how their jobs um, intertwine and stuff like that. But we will be talking to more than just cinematographers because I think um, a wider scope is prudent, especially, you know, when a podcast gets going and is successful, you need to widen the scope a little bit, throw, throw out a wider net. But Today, to kick off season two, we are talking to Boris Moisovsky. Uh, he is the DP of um, Titans on HBO Max, the you know DC superhero show, and Lost Symbol on Peacock, the Dan Brown uh, show, or based on Dan Brown's books, rather. But um, Boris is awesome. Um, this is one of my favorite talks. I say, I feel like I say that every episode. This is one of my favorite talks I've ever had, but they just keep getting better. Um, you know, we, we were a little philosophical, which is always awesome. Um, and you know, towards the end when we really start talking about the shows quite practical. Um, so you get a, the best of both worlds in that case. Um, Boris is an ASC and CSC member, by the way, I should throw some respect on his name. Uh, I didn't earlier on and yeah, going forward with frame and reference, uh, this season, I think we're going to have an amazing time. So, uh, if you're new, welcome. Uh, and if you are a long time listener, thanks for coming back. So yeah, let's, uh, kick off season two with, uh, this discussion with Boris Moisovsky, ASC, CSC. <laughs> Well, the, so the way that I like to get started with, with any of these, just to introduce the audience, is just asking, how did you get started in cinematography? Like, what was your, um, not your career path, but what got you interested in images? I know you kind of uniquely had a sort of a lineage of, of image makers in your family. Well, my dad was a cinematographer, um, director as well, and um, he, um, I, I spent a lot of time on film sets. And it's funny when you spend a lot of time on film sets as a kid, uh, well, at least for me, that didn't result, it didn't kind of like computers. Like I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to be a, a filmmaker because I spent a lot of time on film sets. I didn't want to actually be a filmmaker because I saw that it was hard work and I like, a, it was a little bit chaotic, chaotic. And, and I remember being uh, cold all the time <laughs> for some reason. I remember those experience. Um, but, um, so I, um, I, I always wanted to be a writer and that's what I was kind of doing. And, you know, this filmmaking world was something that my dad did and I was, you know, I knew all his buddies and friends and, you know, people he worked with. And then eventually, um, I, uh, but I always had a camera and, and, uh, which was, I don't know how aware I was of that, uh, but I always took pictures and then eventually later on, um, you know, um, I was kind of pushed to uh, by by my wife to or well, my girlfriend at the time, but like she she really she thought that I could do well as a as a filmmaker, and and there was this uh, this kind of impossible film academy to get into. Um, they had so many applicants, and it was so hard to get into whatever. And uh, and she said you should apply. I did. And I thought I wouldn't have stand a chance, but I got in. And that, that's where I started thinking, like, you know, maybe I can be a filmmaker. So, and after that, after that, I, I you know, I kept taking pictures and, and you know, I, I started, I started thinking like, like I was trained to be a director. I was never trained to be a cinematographer. So just, you know, my photography background maybe allowed for me to translate stuff into the cinematography realm, maybe. Yeah, that's uh, 
interesting you came from a, a, a kind of a writing background because I so I came from just being a, a fan of movies you know I didn't have any like connections which I think is probably most folks uh and I thought I thought I wanted to be in charge of the image like that's what got me into cinematography come to find out I wanted to get into props I, <laughs> I liked what I was looking at I didn't realize I didn't that but um the thing that was hardest for me like becoming a cinematographer was like learning what the language like the the storytelling aspect of imagery you know mm-hmm. did does did that help you at all or were they kind of separate brains well it's interesting it's not separate brains i i this i don't how do i make this super to the point and simple i um we got an hour you're good <laughs> it's it's interesting how filmmaking is nowadays there there's this whole talk about storytelling as the main element of, of filmmaking and that's fine in the narrative you know in the narrative cinema or television etc it's fine i don't know if it's a i don't really know if it's the main thing because the the, the what would separate cinema from other arts is all the other things the story is just one of them the story is just one of the things that you put in there and you don't have to and and in fact you know originally i mean cinema really corresponds much better to poems uh than than to to really you know a straight narrative of a, of a you know uh, uh, like a regularly structured story but um but we do communicate in cinema mostly in through the dramatic structure of a story so so the images convey similar things to story but what i think is very interesting is uh, or what i find the most exciting is like you know when you watch a uh, tree of life and where the images and the story are actually at a disconnect until they come together they they've like kind of complete each other and then they go away again and you're putting that drama the drama's happening in your brain your your heart and your soul you're putting it together uh and then the story and the images together create a cinema and i think that's essential um and i believe in that truly uh so i don't think that that images tell a story but the images and the story together create cinema if that makes sense yeah yeah like um that's a good point because I, I think like watching films, I obviously like gravitate towards. I try not to do the analytic. You know, people always ask like, since you're a cinematographer, do you just like judge a film the whole time? And it's like only if it's bad. Like if it's mm-hmm. like, and I don't mean the cinematography even. I mean well, unless it really stands out. But like if the story is bad, then I have time to judge or or even mm-hmm. even if it's good story or a uh, good cinematography, bad story, then I have the time to like sit there and go like, well, the lighting's good. But if it's all together. You know, mm-hmm. you, you're not sitting there thinking about it. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I, 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 you know, but th- there's also a thing. Cinema is so unique in cinema and television, you know, whatever it is now. It's all uh, the same whatever, now. Whatever <laughs> distinction. It's like, is it, is it not? Like, you know, I, I, I kind of like, you know what I like? I like, I like to think that um, you can have, I mean, let's say Breaking the Waves, Breaking the Waves is a, is a fantastic film that doesn't look good. But it doesn't look good, not, not like it's bad cinematography. No, it looks appropriate, but it looks really rough. It looks, you know, like you, you take that and apply it to something else. Well, that, that, that would not be appropriate. It has to be appropriate. So the image can be ugly, but appropriate. So I think what you were talking about, and, and I, I think about this all the time, when you, when you look at... Um, a film and you're out of it and you start analyzing it, that's because the film doesn't work and the right. story if the story worked fully and these images were appropriate for it you wouldn't care if it's poorly shot because that poorly shot thing was fitting for that story or with that story even better right so it's such a fine line of you know s- some things that I, I look at on the second or third viewing and i think okay well, I would I would shoot this differently. Why does this why is this not maybe great cinematography? Or why is it great cinematography? And I think, what if it wasn't? You know, what would that be? And then I realized that an entity of, of film, you know, can only happen once through somebody's you know collective eye of the, the, all the filmmakers, whatever. And then it can be maybe there might be a variation that redoes that, but that's rare, right? I mean, there's some 
some instances of that. But does it, when it works, it works for some kind of magical reason where it doesn't have to be the best imagery. It doesn't have to be the best story. Because like, you can take the story of uh, Godfather. Like the story of Godfather is a very simple story, but the film is very complex because it's about morality. It's about all these things that the story wasn't. Mm. But as a film, together with these images and this story, as close to perfection as it gets, right? So, so I, I love, I love kind of thinking about philosophically about why cinema has those unique properties because it works on an emotional level, not just on the story level, not just on the visual level. That's yeah. So this is something I think about a lot, especially recently. I think mm-hmm. people can over analyze and try to make a perfect film, you know, a correct film, let's say. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Recently, I've been thinking a lot about how much of filmmaking, how much cinematography or just the movie in general is feeling, you know, like maybe something isn't right, but it feels correct. And I think right now we kind of are in um, a society where uh, we eschew feeling for technically correct in many forms, not just art, but kind of in general. And um, I'm wondering kind of. (laughs) It because it's so undefinable. I'm hoping you can now define it. Uh, <laughs> um, where h- how do you think is it just practice being able to have a set skill and then learn how that makes you feel and then kind of forget it and just trust yourself to know that what you're doing fits everything or, or you know how do you how do you kind of navigate that mental sort of quagmire? Well, it's it that's that's that it it thing you know that that's yeah. the magic i think uh and um as young cinematographers right like we look and analyze things and we learn to you know do this and that and then slowly but surely you realize like you're told that you know the bigger the source the closer that source is to the subject the softer that light will be okay well you're told that you can think about that you can do all this but then one day and that's kind of a relatively simple concept but one day that clicks and you see it and you realize it. And not, now, now you realize that you can actually push that and make it triple the size and it's going to be equally soft, but then you can do a move. And, and, then, and then it clicks and then that's the easiest thing in the world. And now you're not thinking about it. Now you're using it, right? right. And so, but that now, you know, when you get to a certain level where, where there's many things like that that click, right? Whatever, or what does it mean to, you know, move the camera without a tilt or a pan where the dolly or whatever the crane brings you and the camera is nodal and all the lines are in painterly perspective and all those important things to me. Uh, but all those I could have known about, but I didn't know how they fit or how to apply them. Right. And, and then the moment you're not thinking about them, that means you understand them, you know, and, and it also means that maybe half, maybe 40% of what you do and you think you understand, you also don't understand, but it's happening. But you're allowed because you understand the majority of it. So, so it's kind of like that magic tops magic. Like you know, like you just it, 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 the magic keeps multiplying, and that's beautiful. Uh, and then at some point, you, you you start talking about how like none of that technicality matters. Well, it does because you could have never you know done any of this if you didn't understand it. Um, and and then then you start you know applying or, or thinking about philosophically. Then you start. You know, maybe the deduction of things that, like you, you, you start uh, maybe going against the norm. Maybe you, you, you reduce everything to its essence. Like all these things. Now you're experimenting, and that now you can, you know, like, like, like a painter. You know, Picasso could draw a perfect rabbit, but then from that perfect rabbit, he, you know, like he wanted to to show a human human face form in a three three dimensional image on that. On that. Uh, on a piece of paper or whatever. And, and so he he completely uh, dissected what that rabbit meant once upon a time, right? So so to get all that, he needed to know how to draw that rabbit realistically. So we all need to know how to draw, how to draw that rabbit. Otherwise, we are faking it. I think it's very important to know how to draw a real rabbit, like a realistic looking rabbit. And then that rabbit can be super abstract after that. Um, mm-hmm. And once you understand the, the rules of that, then you're really free to do whatever you want. And then that feeling comes. Then, then I can walk into that, you know, the room that you're in and, you know, turn everything off and, and just expose for those blinds behind you and say, 
this is this is what I feel here. Those white walls will fall. Like you know, the, there's going to be enough of the range by the time I see on the couch or whatever, and I'll be confident in that. And then with that confidence, with that confidence comes a special image because you you watch Dune. Dune is technically perfect, of course, uh, super imagined, like, but everything feels right in Dune. There's no, there's nothing that stands out. Everything goes together. So, so you know, Greg Fraser and 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 Bill Newman, all, all these guys, you know, obviously a million people around them, they kind of the symbiosis happened because they're all on that level or similar level where they like all their knowledge kind of came within. Like, there's a pyramid, like there's a peak, and they, that peak made that, you know, beautiful movie. And, and that's yeah. what we are all striving for. Does that, yeah. that, does that make any sense? <laughs> absolutely. No, absolutely. You're, you're totally speaking my language here. Um, on, a, on a sort of a more technical level almost, uh, you know, like famously Gordon Willis had to, you know, scared the shit out of everyone, all the producers on The Godfather because uh, everything was dark and top lit and was, we can't see his fucking eyes. Um have you ever run into a situation where you're like, no, this, this is the feeling we're going for. And you had like higher ups that maybe didn't know the art. We're like, no, no, no. It has to look like this. Cause this is going to sell or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, listen, uh, I think I've been lucky to only have, I had only one situation where somebody was TV show. Um, and my look was tweaked. Uh, but I've been lucky my whole career where like I would, and I listen, it also comes with like lucky comes with being brave, being bold, being like believing in what it is, right? Where you go, well, I, I understand this, you're pick something, superhero, whatever, uh, television series or action series, but I really think they should all be silhouettes and this is why I'm doing it. And also like kind of doing that with such confidence that nobody can question it. Right. And, and then, uh, but you gotta, you gotta also kind of get there and then believe in yourself. And, and I, I don't think there is in television in general, and people might hate that I'm saying this, there's a lot of safe, um, sure. doing, you know, like, uh, like, let's do it. Let's also cover this and this. So we'll see later if we use, but who's we, who's going to do it later? Who, who are these people? These, who's making the movie? You know, like that, that question is like so weird in television because we will do something that's called coverage. Coverage is a weird word, you know, like there's no coverage in Doom. There's a mm -hmm. shot that needs to be in this scene and there's a, the next shot is this. And only those shots are the shots for this scene. There's no 10 more alternative shots. And that's why that's so good. But sometimes we make television, we want it to be like Doom, but we do it the opposite way. We also yeah. cover it. So somebody somewhere will also try this, this, and this. It's like, well, that wasn't our intention. Well, we shot, we, we gave it like we, you know, who we all have faults for things, not kind of working out the way. Like, so I saw, so you know, that one instance when, when my look was changed, it, it, I'm to blame because I didn't realize what kind of show I was on. I was pushing something that, maybe wasn't right. Maybe I wasn't confident. Like I, I can, I can find faults in, in me for that. So you need to, therefore need to be super honest with yourself first, then, then do something that's brave or not. Like, you know, darkness is something I like. I always have very dark things. People, every network, every studio always comments that, you know, something's too dark. And then we kind of go, okay, well, this is why this is what we're trying to do. We, pre I prepare um, what we call a visual manifesto, visual manifesto is like how something's going to look with the reference and everything. So we go, well, no, no, this is the philosophy we're going for. We adjust from there if we need to, but you know, all of a sudden we're not going to make it super bright, etc. Like we stand behind what we decided to do. And, and I think that's very important. That's how you do something special because we wouldn't have the look of Godfather, which therefore influenced the look of like a gazillion things after if Gordon wasn't confident stubborn and so good you know yeah. that that's what we need to be a little more and you know it's easy to say well it's television we can't do that no yes we can yes uh, you and i know examples of many television shows that do that and we like it so if we like that why are we making whatever our show differently no yeah. we should make what we feel you know or what you know we all like and, and we feel like there's a bunch of people that need to be on the same page but 
but you also have to figure out as a cinematographer how to get those people on the same page or on your page that you know that you're trying to kind of like you know push so the show can be dark brown and top lit with no eyes whatever yeah yeah it's funny uh like the coverage thing is kind of funny because uh undoubtedly they're trying to you know cover their ass and <laughs> that's the real coverage and uh sort of save money i guess you know we don't have to do research we need to make sure we get everything here it's like yeah but you're spending if we know we got the shot you're technically spending more money to keep shooting something like you're keeping every one here longer you're still you got maybe rent longer whatever you know so it's kind of yeah. like you know cutting the bottom off a blanket and sewing it to the top um but uh the other thing that you mentioned about um recognizing within yourself did you was the look uh tweaked in post or did they like tell you no we're moving that well i i was in in a particular instance actually quite nice people that, that I, I i was working with and we arrived at this like really advanced look uh with the show run like it was a 70s movie and all that like look the movie wasn't in the 70s but the series wanted that feel and we arrived there and together and all of that and then, then that, you know like you the usual they said is it a little dark and the answer is no, no, that's what we want. But the answer was, unfortunately, yeah, we're making it a little brighter. So then it came to me. I'm like, well, we're, we don't want, I don't want to make it brighter. This, this is what we talked about. So eventually I had that many warning signs and in the end, they made it a little brighter. Was it a disaster? No. Um, what was my version much more appropriate for the, the from, for the series? Probably. Uh, but there it is like it happened to me once i think it has to happen to everybody so so i learned from that i was like well look what i was trying to do on a network show like yeah who, who's to blame there like me because i didn't realize this is a main network show they will not go for all of that so i needed to maybe feel a little more you know like whichever way to get my way but you know make them feel like they're getting the look that's safer i guess right well and so that brings me to the what my point was going to be, uh, you, you might notice in our time together that I have a habit of starting one question and then qualifying it with a different one and then coming back to it. That's uh, all I'm good. sure, I'm sure the listeners over a year now are fucking thrilled with it. Um, but, uh, the, the friends in my life certainly are, um, something that I, you know, everyone I think matures at a different rate, but one point where I could tell like, all right, I'm, I'm, I don't think I have like, not a youthfulness. What am I trying to say? Like, like an uh, uneducated energy or something like that was, um, when I learned how to not be defensive when stuff like that happens, recognize, like you were saying, oh, these are some things that I did wrong and, st and still being able to say like, and that's what they did wrong. Like you can, I d but, but starting with what could I have done differently or like, how could I have managed that? So in a lot of cases, uh, you know, you'll, I've found that, um, working, if you're working for a network or whatever, being like, okay, I know, I now know what they want. What can I do to kind of trick them into doing what I want, <laughs> you know, or, and have like a backup plan to give them their thing if they need it but like try to sneak my thing in there. And like, that was, that was yeah. very uh, helpful to me as a person. I don't, not just a cinematographer. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, it's interesting. I, I, I guess it's because of my background, like, you know, my, my Bosnian stubbornness or whatever, like I'd like to be as straight up as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll often in the interview stage to get a job, I'll say, this is what I'm about. So I don't think you want me if you don't like those things, you know, and yeah. I think that's very fair to, to myself, but more importantly to them. Um, and you can't, you know, I, I, I don't advise young cinematographers to go do that very straight up because you need to get some jobs to, to, to kind of get, like, you got to judge that. You, gotta you gotta earn it. Yeah. You, you know, and, and you feel it when you, when you can't do that, but, but being honest, being honest and being truthful is very important because then you carry that same thing, how you light, how you frame, how you direct actors, how you write, whatever you are doing, you're carrying that same thing. It's a very anchoring good thing. So you're never, you're never, you're trying to never, because we've all done what you're saying and that makes sense, but then you're never actually going, oh yeah, I'll, I'll make this whatever 
uh, you know, I, I used to, a long time ago, I would give, you know, uh, an example of like, you know, the frame, how I want it to be, you know, colored, very desaturated. And then I would desaturate one, one more super, like almost black and white. And then I would saturate one like in a bad way. And then I would show them that and they would pick mine. Like that's manipulative and but I've done it, you know, as a young sure. cinematographer. So we were on the same. But I don't I don't do like I, I now only in that manifest that this is what I see. And then comments, comments, we talk, we talk, we talk, because we we're creating something. And then then that's the honest, truthful thing that we carry. And once we, we all, you know, is like we'll evolve, but that's what we agreed to. That's what we wanted. So so I expect everybody to be as honest as me. And if they're not, well, then you deal with that, you know, and that's okay. Well, and that honesty, I, I, I agree with you. And also that honesty um, gives you a position of, of uh, not pride, but um, confidence. You know, you're not going out on a limb and trying something. It's like, this is coming for me. I know this. If it's challenged, I can back it up. And I know, you know, what I'm talking about in this instance. No, very true. Very true. And and it gives you calm. I mean, that's like, you know, yeah. when we're kids, you're, you're, you're lying about something and it's a white lie, but like, you feel like, oh my God, they can read through your parents know that you bought candy for that money. You know, like you, yeah. you never want to feel like deceiving somebody, especially in the world where you're like, there's so many elements to cinematography, directing television, directing, I mean, um, Films. There's so many elements. Like, the more, the more you can take away from the complication of things of, of the process, then why wouldn't you? And I think that that honesty and truthfulness is like takes one big complication away. Less politics, less everything. You just like you're there because well, I have a crew. Like, I work with the same ish crew for like 15 years, and we're all good friends, and and we all like we don't have to even talk about it. We used to talk about it, but we don't anymore. Um, yeah, we like, all we care about is that frame, like that frame, whatever aspect ratio it is, <laughs> whatever format, that's what, that's everything. Everything else yeah. outside the frame can be somebody's ego, bad idea, you know, politics, what good idea, whatever. But within that frame is what counts. And, and when you do that, it's so simple. Do we have, you know, do we have issues? Do we have complications? Well, of course we do, but, when you focus on that one thing and everybody honestly wants that to be the best, it doesn't matter what it is then. It's just like the frame will be as good as we can make it. Totally. Um, kind of going back to uh, something I wanted to touch on uh, was your background in photography. Did you have um, kind of influences growing up or was it more of just like a sort of creative, just like snapping around or somewhere? Did you have kind of like a intent there? Well, my dad would give me, um, he, my dad really believed in, uh, in, uh, you know, the, the, like knowing technically, uh, knowing what one is doing, it was very important in order to break the rules and whatever else you want to do. Um, so he would give me assignments, uh, oh, cool. depending on my age, he would give me, give me assignments that are not unlike the assignments that you would get, uh, like photography academy or cinematography or something where he would say, okay, well, you know, uh, an exercise in day for night or, or uh, uh, pictures with only three colors in them um, mm. or, I mean, many like patterns or whatever it is. And then you go for that and, you know, try, or, or portraits that are only with the 50 mil or, or just use 50 mil. Like there's so many of these things that you can do and it's fun. Uh, and then I would do that and then he would like, I would print the photographs and he would take them and then <clears throat> take two pieces of paper and then like reframe them for me and go, is this better? Is that better? You know, I learned and framing was very important to him. Um, you know, obviously light, you know, why the light is a certain way, etc. And, and then, you know, at some point that came naturally to me. So, you know, that moment, that moment is actually the most magical in photography. When you feel what the right composition is, that is so important like that like that i envy every kid uh you know who will arrive at that you know at some point soon uh as they're developing their you know picture taking and you just feel that that's right and then you need to be able to explain why that is but as you take that picture you know you took a good one you know like that is so good and why it, the it really does like i know exactly what you're talking it's it, the way i've 
like you just saying that the way I kind of visualize it is when I'll be shooting something and uh, when I, you know, chimp the frame or whatever <laughs> it for a second, I'm like, I don't think I took that. Like it huh. exists outside my creation. Like it's like too good. You know, <laughs> like that's not, <laughs> do we frame this? What, <laughs> you know, nice. Yeah. That exists in, in, you know, every day on set that is like when we do something and like you look through a viewfinder, it's good. It's here. And I, we think we're, it's here. And my, my operator, Joe or Dave, um, they'll go, okay. Yeah. That's, you know, we look through the, we have a democratic tool. We call it, it's, a, it's called the, the device. <laughs> just an iPad with the with Artemis and handles. And, uh, and handles, you know, like that thing. Um, so we look at it and somewhere there. And then when I come back in whatever, five minutes, just to check on whichever frame, and you look and you go, that's not like every, every like there, every single intention and emotion, everything, like it ju- it's just perfect. And it, it just makes you happy. And then sometimes you come there and, and Joe would say to me, it's never going to work. Like, and it really, like you look at, oh my God, it's never going to work. And then we, we have this, um, Joe invented this phrase, uh, apparently we together invented this phrase, which is struggle, struggle, love it, which means we're going to struggle, struggle. And then all of a sudden we go, love it, love it, love it leave, it, leave it, you know, <laughs> make That's t-shirt. Perfect. Yeah. Another thing that would be good to make, uh, it would be just thinking about like your dad giving you assignments would be like a little, like, 36 point uh assignments like one roll of film Mm -hmm. just to like just yeah i'm just saying like to distribute to people you know just to put out there on the internet and be like here's like if (laughs) you know one one roll film school like you know here's 36 photos you should take do that because i remember i remember when i was in uh i went to new york film academy before i went to college just on like Mm -hmm. a summer program and that was one thing they had us do is because we would have um, 400 foot rolls of 16. So whatever mm-hmm. that was like eight minutes or something. And they gave us like a shot list and they were like, you know, and it was simple stuff. Cause it was always black and white. So it was like underexposed, a stop underexposed, two stops overexpose this, you know, get a close up like this, blah, 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 blah. But it would be cool now that you mentioned it, like we'll have to work on that. We'll work on that later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good. But yeah. Um, so how does your, photography so your photo this is i'm gonna keep harping on this because i'm fascinated because i started in photography as well i suppose but it was not a artistic endeavor it was literally just shoot i liked images and i liked taking pictures of my friends and it was but a composition was completely out the window i learned about lighting like <laughs> i think my i bought my first flash like like off camera flash like six years into owning a camera you know um I guess I didn't do photos first because I was shooting video before that, but you know, stealing the parents camcorder and whatnot. But, um, photography and cinematography are like a Venn diagram where some things are the same, but there's a lot of photo, like I've, I've gotten in the hat. Tim Ives actually turned me on to a shit ton of photo books that he uses as reference. So I bought a bunch of them and, uh, looking through them, there's a lot of stuff where I'm like, wow, this is perfect. And a lot of stuff I'm like, no one, this would never, I mean, it shouldn't say never, but like they don't immediately stand out as a cinema frame. Mm -hmm. Roger Mm -hmm. Deakins' book. I just got Byways. I actually have two copies on action. Yeah, me too. Uh, uh, And a lot of his photos do not look like cinema Mm -hmm. frames, you know, like that's a different brain. How do you, um, how do those two things work for you in your head? Like where, where do you, how do you approach those? Well, it's, it's a difference between, I mean, it's, it's very simple. Um, I don't think it's simplistic. It's very complicated, but it's simple. Uh, there's a difference between motion and the moment. You know, photography is mm-hmm. all about the moment. Um, and no matter what it is, it, like even if it's a landscape with mountains, it's still a moment in time that that was the photograph that, you know, is only seen through your eyes if you took it, etc. And then cinema that has uh, elements of that depending on you know what it is, but, but the motion, the fact that you know, there's motion of film through that uh, through that camera, and there is multiple images that capture all these moments. But together, they create movement. Um, uh, that, that's all the difference you need to know to understand that you know, one photograph versus many photographs that create meaning is 
a big difference. And, and that's the difference between cinema and, and, and photography. And also the function of photography and the function of cinema are very different. Um, I think they're both forms of art, fine, uh, of course. And, and but, you know, uh, cinema is a, or television or whatever, make a, you know, melange of things. Um, yeah. It, it also evolved just like photography did. Photography, like, you know, everything is photography. Snapping a picture of your dog jumping in the snow is photography with your phone. Uh, but Ansel Adams is photography too, right? So so they're in the same, but, but they're not. Like, it's not really the same thing. Same 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 thing with, with you know, television and, and film, et cetera, where that, you know, artistic medium that, you know, becomes um, also an informational entertainment um which the, the word ent- entertainment because it's the inter- entertainment industry first well you know drama theater therefore cinema so like it's all meant to be a discussion on a theme something that happens in our lives and then we all discuss it through art painting whatever uh well when you when you say that it's entertainment first they obviously evolved or or went into a different direction uh that takes it away from it it's maybe you know intended essence and that's what happened with both photography and and cinema in some ways but we're still talking about things that are essentially cinematic for example in cinema which is you know like you can't say that you know i don't know, pick some pick something like you know a fincher film is always very 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 cinematic equally to a fincher series you know like that that's you know uh or or a photograph that is um uh, uh, a full recreation or something seemingly real um, and and something that's a real moment that was captured both of them are like come back to that as essence of the moment you just recreated one and then captured it and the other one is you have to steal it steal that moment so um, they they are very different they depend on each other and uh, I, I think most cinematographers my dad always said that and I I, I, I never I, I don't know if I ever understood to it fully until maybe recently but my dad was always saying like most cinematographers don't make good photographers because if they're good cinematographers their brain and their souls now thinks very differently because the purpose of that of cinematography is different than the purpose of photography yeah yeah because like a uh, a portrait is often very different than a close-up but could off like a you know a, a movie or whatever uh but could be executed nearly identically could, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I would love to see <laughs> just as like an exercise. Or so, although he did do it. Um, do you know Dan Winters, the photographer? I am not sure. No. Look up <laughs> Dan Winters. He's a uh, very unique um, lighting style. And uh, mm-hmm. I think he only shoots. I can't see. He probably doesn't only shoot film, but uh, does a lot of you might. You'll probably recognize him. he's been hired for a lot of editorial. But he, his lighting style is so unique that I've always thought like, if this guy shot a movie, this would look uh-huh. weird if he did it the same and not like cool, but like very uh, hyper stylized mm-hmm. kind of um, not like a Martin Scholler kind of like craziness. But um, but then he did. He made a short film, but it's like mostly like animated and stuff. And uh-huh. from the I haven't seen it. I would love to interview the man. But um, it looks like he didn't do his traditional thing. He did more of like a, you know cinematic lighting and stuff like that. And I was really fascinated by that, that he would not, not that like it's, it was surprising, but that he kind of stuck to a more traditional. Well, yeah. Way Cause the it. media kind of carries that message. Right. And, yeah. And it's, uh, it, it makes sense. It does make sense. There are, yeah. however, there are photographers that, or even more interesting, there are painters that I'd love to know how they would make a movie. You know? how, yeah. Like what movie would look like if they see the world that way. You know how do you translate that into something you know seemingly realistic which is the, the lure of cinema too uh but how would i don't know uh would, yeah. whatever, like like the, you know how would they make it? so i don't know yeah that's it's fascinating i i reference paintings more than, than photographs i don't know why you know that is something that a lot of the people i've interviewed have said that uh it's more and i and I thought about that too. Like, and I, I wonder if it's because the uh, painting is like the ultimate artistic expression of not only the artist, but 
light. Like it's fully controlled. Like I'm sure you've been in a situation where you're like, oh, I just want to tweak that just a little. Then you kind of have to go mm-hmm. with it because you don't have time or a budget or whatever. But a painter has theoretically all the time in the world to get that mm-hmm. light slash, you know, the Caravaggio kind of mm-hmm. thing going. Perfect. It's like to them, you know, whatever they meant to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, and that's a complete guess, but I'm wondering if that's kind of the. Well, part of it is, uh, I think that's why cinematography and painting uh, has, like, I, I believe in those similarities because both recreate the world um, in, in many ways from scratch. I mean, sometimes, you know, obviously we, we shoot something in a real location, but we still manipulate it because we take it from this angle, that angle, with the, this light or that, or that light. But um, it's a painter uh, really chooses the moment and recreates it fully because it doesn't even have to exist. But cinema is like that too. Like none of this exists until that camera rolls and, you know, then, then we shape the light or whatever and all those external things of time and ability, and, et cetera, are granted. But when you eliminate them, we actually do quite similar things to, to painters because we completely recreate. Not that the photographers don't because there are some that do that and that's the cool part. Of course, yeah. Um, so, so it all it all is related. And I I don't know. Maybe that's I don't know why. You know, when you look at a, a painting, what happens to me at least? I, I really look beyond the painting, or I feel beyond that painting, right? Because you look at it and you imagine what that world is like if that person got up from the window in the Rembrandt painting and went up those stairs. What's up the stairs? You know, and that becomes a movie. Then, um, not that you don't again do that in the photograph, but I. I find that the paintings are maybe uh, by what they are, by their medium, maybe they have, they carry even more magic. I don't, I don't know if that's shallow thinking. <laughs> no, no. You know, that, that brings me to an interesting thought. Uh, I've, I have a theory that, that a lot of people, because, you know, there's that right now, especially in the kind of, um, let's say, indie world or like newcomer sort of world, let's say. There's, there's this voracious appetite to make things cinematic. And I think that the rise of better and better cameras has made cinema harder to achieve because it's now too realistic. And I think a photograph is fairly realistic. I mean, like in, in the sense of the image, right? A painting is expressive it leaves Mm -hmm. room it's it's imaginative and you know we see plenty of people who will make films and you 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 throw some filters on it you know you fuck with it in the in the grade or whatever you try you try to take away the reality you try to muddy it a little bit so that Mm -hmm. it's not so um you know people always say like oh we we want people to be fully immersed in in the movie and it's like no you don't because if someone was murdered in front of you you'd be horrified if you were fully (laughs) immersed yeah yeah, you want them you want them to be to buy into the story you don't want them to be like locked in it's not a documentary um and i'm so maybe that's like the the painting thing is like it's it's enough a way that you you can really buy into it you can create the world you know in your head yeah well they're they're you know and we're we're often after that painterly feel right and then you know so uh, actually probably should talk about the show that sent you over here or the shows, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, do you work with Frasier like a lot or is it just so happened that you two shot two series together? Uh, well, I, um, I was, um, Cause Frazier, I'm talking to him tomorrow. Oh, cool. Cool. Uh, Frazier and I met uh, a while ago. He's, uh, I, I was a little bit of a mentor of Frazier. And then when, um, you know, as we progressed with uh, with various shows, he started doing second unit for us when he started shooting, and then more and more. And Frazier's a super talented guy. So at some point in season two, two of Titans, um, he shot the episode. Uh, he shot the episode I directed, and um, and then um, and then uh, when it came to season three. Uh, Brendan Stacy, who alternated with me previously, he uh, he moved on, and we. Uh, I thought Fraser was ready to to take the next step, and he was definitely ready, more than ready. 
And uh, and then same thing with Langdon. You know, we got, uh, oh, sorry, with the lost symbol. Um, we got to, uh, we have a, we had a lot of friends on that show, the producer, et cetera. I was still on Titans. And, um, and I, Frasier was finishing earlier. So I said, listen, you guys, let's go. Let, let's, Frasier comes over. I'm still in Titans. Then I come over. Like we made a complicated deal, but it really worked out. So, so we are, we love working with each other and it's a, it's a lot of fun. He's a very talented kid. Yeah. I, uh, I have a confession and that is when Titans first came out, I was like, Oh, that could be cool. And then reviews are coming out. like, it is cool. And I was like, Oh, well, fuck it. I'm going to watch it. And then I am the worst at getting on TV shows, like watching TV shows. So I didn't. So, uh, so, but, uh, I just watched, I picked an episode. I was just like, you know, I'm going to go through here and just grab one, just watch it, see what we're talking about. And I picked the red hood episode because I had seen the animated movie. Uh-huh. Um, and I come from, I was trying to find some I might remember. Cause I come from the, uh, kind of Batman original animated series era. <laughs> uh, I didn't really watch teen Titans. Um, mm-hmm. love the, love the sort of, uh, vibe, I guess of the show that, you know, more mature, like superhero kind of, it does, it doesn't quite feel like a, a superhero show necessarily, even though there's very superhero things about it. Um, I will say, so I have to ask, did you shoot Red Hood? I don't think I shot, which one's Red Hood? That, one, um, that's the one where, uh, all the people are being done up in Red Hoods and like they bomb. Oh bank. yeah. No, Fraser shot that. Fraser so shot that. that was the thing that sucks. So on the IMDB, it says you both shot everything. And then about halfway through the Red Hood episode, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I just realized I don't know if he shot this. And then it got <laughs> all the way through to the end. And then it said like cinematography by Frazier. And I was like, shit. And, like, <laughs> and that's okay. Um, we, we have but, a similar, I mean, he, Frazier, you know, adopted the style that we shot, the, you know, the show with. So he, he's more, you know, capable and he upgraded it. Um, so, so yeah, it's fine. We, we shoot in a very similar way. Right on. So I'll, I have, I'll have specific questions for him then, but it was funny in the opening scene of that show. Uh, Cause I was watching it like kind of analytically for the interview. Uh, first thing I saw was like 18 Titan tubes on top of this, uh, you know, um, center table. And I was, uh-huh. and I was like, ah, Titan tubes. Stupid. Um, cause the show's <laughs> called Titans. Uh, but, uh, kind of something that I noticed about the, at least the episode, but I assume this is kind of through the show is there's a lot of mixed color temperatures. Mm-hmm. Um, is that what's kind of the approach there and, um, how do you balance the realism of the show with the sort of hyper realism of it being a, a comic book or superhero adaptation? Well, it, it's interesting you ask that because from the, when we did the pilot for, for the show, um, a bunch of people, uh, Greg Walker, our showrunner, Greg Berlanti, our produ- you know, producer and, uh, and then uh, Kiva Goldsman, um, Jeff Johns, and uh, um, a bunch of other people. We were talking about um, what the show wants to be. Well, I don't know if it's a bunch of other people, but, you know, a few more people in there. Um, Brad Anderson, who, who directed the pilot, and myself. And we were like, okay, well, what, what, what should this show be? And we all kind of brought the same or similar feel to it because we really wanted it to be grounded. We want to be, be grounded so so people feel for these characters uh, in a in a in a good way, so they see their human side, and then you know eventually they'll they'll fight in these costumes and they're superheroes. That's what you you'll expect, but they will have the drama about them will be not the drama of the superhero, but the drama of a person, and that's how the the show was conceptualized and, and carried out. And you know the the whole beginning of the show. Um, with the famous fuck Batman line like that, that kind of was like a grounding line for us and where, where, you know, Robin and eventually Nightwing goes. Um, but, um, we, uh, in, in the quest to, to be grounded, we, you know, we knew, we knew that there are going to be certain aspects of, of the show that will feel like a comic book because once everybody puts those costumes on, it will feel like a comic book and the costumes are great, but you know, that's a comic booky thing. Right. So, um, 
other than that, we try to make it as indie looking as possible within this world and make it super dark because there were some very dark themes that we're playing with. So, you know, it all came together. And it's, you know, we talked about it earlier. It's one of those moments we start shooting day three. We're in this, or two, day two in this police station and we're in Detroit police station, the Christmas detective, this and that. And then you just see around the monitor that everybody is beyond loving what this looks like. You know, dark side camera, simple, super soft lighting, everything is edged with a million Titan tubes and et cetera, whatever. Like our setups are huge, but it's very simple. Mm. And that's that was always my philosophy. Like, that's always my philosophy of, of things. Like how do you reduce everything to the simplest um, elements? And you just see everybody. And, and so, so we never talked about the look again, because that look, that was the look. And everybody was super happy about it. I don't think we ever talked about how desaturated something is, how bright, how, uh, how green, how like, it was like we had full of, like everybody on every level just loved it. And that is magical too. You know, like that's one of those things you, you really want. The look evolved eventually a little bit here and there, like when San Francisco in the second season and third season, we were in, um, in Gotham and, you know, like the first and third season are darker than the middle season. And, Etc. But uh, all of that um, was based on where, well, the story is going, where the characters are, and uh, also based on a lot of experimentation and pushing the boundaries. This is a show that's a, you know, we've been very successful in the, you know, in the, in, in the realm of awards and stuff like that for a show that's essentially a superhero show, with the difference that we were set up to and allowed to be different and special and and you know that's that's amazing because that's what we were given like we were set up to succeed uh yeah. so everybody who came in just followed the the look followed the the feel and it was easy um speaking of the sources uh it was always a thing to like we, we desaturate quite a bit so so and therefore the mixing of the source i i really like to mix sources and i, I like the the warm light to hit somebody who's far from the windows um, but I also, in the first season, well, in the second season, all the seasons, uh, it's, it's a very cool, uh, in, the, in, the, in terms of the spectrum, very cool uh, looking show. Um, yeah. on, so so it's, it's, it, it does have the, the blue and cyan, mostly it's prominent. It, it's quite desaturated. Um, and there are various nuances in like what light is allowed to hit where and how far like penetrates into a room and you know that has to do with like where they are psychologically where the character what the character knows about themselves or other people etc so we, we play with that a lot um and light is a luxury in, in the show light is like you get light when there is a reason that you're more visible less visible. We, we, we try we try to care for the characters to to be in a lot of darkness because they are you know? yeah yeah because uh, the reason I ask about the mixed color temperatures is, is I uh, personally have have in my professional career, uh, having been an amateur for a very long time, um, I, I don't feel like I've nailed mixed lighting yet. I don't know. Like on film, it felt easier. And I, mm -hmm. I only shot motion film for a little bit, but film photography, it felt mm -hmm. easier to mix or digital. It just feels so like in this setup, like if this light was warm, even, you know, it, it, exposing it, whatever, you know, at 43, it just still feels so drastically not cohesive. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you approach kind of what, what your philosophy is to mixing sources and how to make it all look like it's not suddenly artificial or um, contrived or whatever. Well, we, we, I, I try not to make it uh, too much of a difference. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, and I also, we, I'm really into the look. Like we really cook a lot of that look on set. We have a, an on-set colorist um, who that was gonna be my we don't do. Question. Yeah, we don't do live color. I don't, don't like live color. But they're in their own trailer, m making stuff according in accordance to what we talk about, and then we constantly revise it the whole day. Um, mm -hmm. But um, but we use a lot of desaturation. Desaturation <laughs> tends to kind. Of bring all, all of that together a little more and melange it. And I, I just don't, um, you know, we, we uh, if, if, uh, if a warm light on your right side there 
is uh, from that lame. Um, sorry, my right. Um, camera right. <laughs> um, <laughs> if uh, if that you know if that that's four thousand, then that you know window is fifty six hundred. That 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 makes sense to me. Uh, gotcha. I would do something like that. Sometimes I'd make that a lot warmer then maybe correct to to that key and let the window go even like for whatever reason um but uh it, it's all about kind of finding those levels so there's no there are extremes but the extremes in color i, I find in general i find that too much color is you know sometimes means that we didn't really refine and define the world uh, so I, I i think too much color is quite Kind of can be vulgar, you know. You need yeah. to really strict color so they mean some like a, a color that's allowed to dominate means something. Um, well, just like with anything else, really. Um, and uh, and we play with quite like our contrast is quite low. It, it, it's just like our levels are quite low as well, so it, it seems contrast, but you see a lot in the shadows and such, which also helps that mix because our fill light when when in existence, and we do have a little bit of it. Um, uh, is usually like if 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 the key light is a little warmer, then that fill is a little cooler, you know. Right. So so those shadows kind of have that, and then we we infuse a lot of a lot of cyan into um, into the shadows, and sometimes around the highlights with the warmth, let's say. Yeah. So it's, is it a very uh, LED heavy show then? Because you're like constantly tweaking color temperatures all over the place. Uh, yeah, it's, it, I don't know if we constantly tweak it. We do tweak it a lot, but it's, it's extremely LED heavy. Well, all, only our big lights are like our 18s, et cetera, HMI. And we, everything is HMI based at our studio as well, which, you know, is expensive for the production. Uh, but, uh, but it allows the most range, uh, because we like to be on the cool side of the spectrum. Um, and then, and then it, it also allows for, for, you know, something that is a lot warmer to go even warmer depending on where you set the camera etc um so other than those big h mice everything is led it's uh titan tube sky panel heavy heavy show uh with light man um the the light gear light mats and uh light time <laughs> and the lights that we build i have a lot of lights that people <laughs> We we'll call them Boris lights because somebody, when we built them the first time, wrote Boris one and Boris two on the first two, and and then they became Boris lights. But they're they're just like it's four by four boxes, and I didn't invent them. Um, but um, they're four by four boxes because uh, I tried to figure out how to make a light that's inherently soft right away when you turn it on. So the the back of a four by four frame essentially is laced with a bunch of LED like a good one, like I buy a really, you know, light gear um, LED. And um, and we, 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 we then diffuse um, maybe, you know, whatever that is, five, six inches from that, heavily diffused with white duvetine and layers, like we're crazy on diffusion. And uh, yeah. and then that, that box is kind of like, I can toss it to you, you can toss it back to me, it's very light, right? So we just lean, you know, wherever we need it. And then people can also grab it and we walk with the light a lot. If, if the camera has marks, actors have, have marks, lights have marks, and then you don't notice it in our show. There's a lot of walking light, but they're big walking sources because a tiny source you can see, big giant source you don't see. And that's another thing that for young cinematographers think about and try. Because when that sinks in, when you see that, like you have a big giant source and you walk everywhere and the light consistently stays the same on, on the face, that's what you want. You don't know it. You don't notice it. When the source is bigger. Yeah, there's actually two things. One, uh, the aha moment for me that was similar to that wasn't necessarily about large sources, but it was about I saw a behind the scenes photo from Fight Club where they had a guy just holding a Kino tube over Edward Norton as he's going down the uh, like the the flat moving sidewalk, you know, and he has his mm-hmm. and in, and and um, it, I it must have been like I was still in college, and I just remember going. Oh, you can move the light with them. No one's going to know that you're just carrying a light over because in your head, you're like, it's, they must've had a big light that went all the way down. The, it's like, no, you just had one little one. You just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. And it's that um, proximity, right? Like how yeah. close it is to him. So all of a sudden a small light becomes big enough. Yeah. And I think it was like, um, wagoned up, you know, the, had a of course, tube of diffusion on it. But, um, 
The second question was going to be, uh, I had taken a peek. I don't have Peacock, so I had to look up some clips. Uh, oh, here's here's the classic coming back around. Uh, I've looked before before we get to Lost Symbol real quick. Um, I looked up some behind the scenes from Titans that I'd found. And going back to your idea of those massive sources, I think it was like, I think it might have been a clip from Red Hood, but the characters, that didn't make any sense. But they're out on a street. And yeah, I saw like a giant 12 by and then a giant eight by. And then I think it was that box you were talking about, but I think it was like a six. And they were like walking around with it. Probably. We have a, uh, we name lights uh, in weird ways. So um, there's a light called the Bosnian shield, uh, which is, I think, a light, you know, I think it's a, it's a four by two and a half or something like that. They'll laugh at me. Uh, so that's the smallest light we carry. We, we would carry um and then from there like we we have uh, something called the beaker box which is uh an eight by six again i'm not certain uh so we can put in those frames we can put a bunch of titan tubes and then heavily diffuse and that's on wheels so it can like on a downtown street they walk we go forever i think um so you probably saw that and uh and then we go like further like as, as we need and we get all the way to and i did not invent this uh david green invented this uh on monkeys when we shot monkeys um it's called uh, taj mahal we call it taj mahal because it's the ultimate light it's a gigantic like they build it to like 30 by whatever oh, 20 <laughs> uh with a giant thing that they build on scuff and inside is like whatever you want three like three 360s through bounced and it's on these special pneumatic wheels so when we have giant buildings um like we have several in Toronto, like these gigantic warehouse buildings we'll build four of those and uh those not necessarily move in the in the, in the shot but you you know you shoot down the line this way and then you have to go further then this light just goes one around and that's how you like the, the big space gets lit super like you know four four guys four people they push it. Okay, we're lit there. We have perfect sun. The side light is our thing, right? And yeah. uh, and then when you reverse, they just go a little bit that way, and you're lit super <laughs> quickly yet super softly. Um, so we have, you know, the names so, like you know our, the Bosnian wedges are these things that uh, in the studio we have sky panels, and then we have intermediate diffusion, and then another diffusion that goes like that. It has all kinds of man, you know maneuvers they can do. So we call that the Bosnian wedge. I don't know why, because it looks like a wedge. Um, you know, we, that's we just give to modify the name. softness, like to, depending on where in the frame it hits. Yeah, like like if, you know, if you go if you go like that with the light, and you bring another one straight down, and then then this one you direct the light a little more, or or you double diffuse, or you lift it up if you don't want it, it can be hard lifting both up. Um, yeah. So we, we we try to be creative with how we achieve things, and we skirt everything. We we try, you know. <laughs> One interesting thing about Titans or anything we do is um, with this amazing crew, they can do it. Um, we we try to give ourselves like three or four looks on stage for each set. So it's like, okay, fly this up, like, make it, make it, you know, there, there's the H mines will go through supplement with a little bit of uh, diff diffused sky panels from above. And then the next scene, take the 18s up on the motor and bring these other sky panels down the Bosnian wedge so it's soft and a little bit of a wrapping soft now we shoot that scene and it looks like it's raining outside whatever when it's sunny when it's raining well it's just so, so the show has a little bit of a dynamic in time you know yeah uh i was gonna so the other thing i was gonna say about lost symbol was just looking at clips and stuff obviously the two shows don't look the same but there are similarities like i could see sort of you in them uh and i was wondering kind of what your Obviously, every show's different and every shot's different. But what kind of is your, what <laughs> is it possible for you to define that unis that I'm seeing? You know, what what are you up trying to do when you see like obviously big soft keys is something I I definitely noticed. You know, a good little scratch um, here and there. But obviously, like you know, the key the keys in uh, or just the whole show in, in um, Lost Symbol very warm. Whereas, like you were saying, Titan's quite cool. But, uh, yeah, like, wh wh how do you kind of, what's your generalized approach there that you're kind of bringing? It's it's very simple. Um, and it, again, once you arrive with it and when it sits, if you like it, then, then you know, applying it is all that kind of is left to do. 
I, I truly believe that um, I work closely with the designer and I truly believe that the designer um, and I will edge the space with a million practicals. You probably noticed, like we have a yes. gazillion of them. They will not really give light. They're they're edging. It. They're they they're not about light. They're they are sculptures of light, um, but they have they give the edge to the space. And then I'm simply there to super softly, as close as I can, with the biggest source I can, to soft light the faces. And that's my mission. And I like the face and everybody looks really good, but it looks very realistic. And, you know, like it's a matter of like just making the right ratio between the background and foreground. That's all I do. Um, it, it's, it's actually great. You say that. Cause that was a note. I did my notes are on top of the teleprompter. Uh, that was something I noticed was all of the practicals and uh, uh, where did I put it? Oh yeah. There's yeah. The question was how many practicals versus fixtures. Uh, because another thing that I've noticed uh, the more and more that I've studied cinematography in my life, but uh, interviewing cinematographers is how important set design is not only to the lighting, but to the look, you know, I've noticed a lot of younger cinematographers think that it all comes down to the colorist, you know, Oh, the, you know, Fincher famously, you know, everything looks kind of green and like flat and stuff. It's like, yeah, but he, he shoots pretty clean. It's like, everything is green on set. You know, the walls are green. It's, he's not, He's not tweaking it, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's crucial. I mean, listen, when, when you tweak it, you need to tweak it from, from a point that you understand and then tweak it to a point that you also understand. So sometimes you'll make one wall green, one gray. So when you take some green out of that, that's the gray is going to get, you know, a little bit of whatever magenta that you want, whatever the, the situation is. But I mean, it's absolutely crucial. I think, I think uh, the, you know, in a, in a cinematic way of working, working with the with the designer is everything because you have to define what it is that we're all after, and then work on these sets together uh, by you know not, not it's not about lighting, not about the look, it's about all of that. And we all have to be in that together, and, and saying that you know there should be two more windows is just one of the things. But what's the feel of this space? So like all of this after the initials catch or whatever the the designer does uh and then inputting these practices then then when you work with a new design for me it's always a well it's not a challenge but at the, the beginning it's like how do i say when i say how many practicals i want in this set they're gonna think i'm insane so i'm just gonna make a joke i always say okay here we go we need this many practicals because when it looks ridiculous it looks right and that's what, what we say, because, it you know, you never actually pay attention to, to that. You don't know that there is 48 practicals in the frame. They're not all in the frame Prepared at the same the, time. Yeah, again, plus that. Um, and then once you develop that trust with the designer, the magic happens. And on Lost Symbol and on Titans, and like we were, I've never not been lucky with that. Uh, I have always been super lucky with that. And uh, and we really do it together. And, you know, they, they influence or they are to praise for the cinematography of of a show as much as any or as, as the cinema, as much as a cinematographer and it should be also vice versa because we need to do that all together then it's really good then yeah. then you know like you know when that's why i give plant lighting plans we always talk about lighting um the feel of it and how it's going to look and then like a sample of this room could look like this we'll light it like this what do you think so the wall actually should be a little bit darker green because that window is going to you know allow a lot of light on that wall behind you on the, on the right you know whatever so we'll make that wall darker that, that's yeah. super important you know to to actually be prepared together yeah i'll uh i got one more super techie question similar to related <laughs> and then i'll let you go because I, I again it's been a few months i was not looking at the time um but uh what are you because i'm you know now that cameras are so sensitive without being noisy and uh we're often using LEDs that aren't necessarily the brightest or, not, you know, depends on the light, obviously. Um, lighting ratios can get kind of flattened out. What what are you, uh, what kind of contrast ratios are you generally aiming for and what tends to be your shooting stop? Because, you know, I, I, I remember using uh, like mole lights and stuff. Turn that thing on, it's like instant F11 you know, that you had to then like bring it all down because it was just blowing out, you know, your sensor, mm -hmm. your film or whatever. Um, but but I did notice that that kind of 
gave the image that snap and stuff. And now everything kind of feels a little flatter if you don't massage it. Yeah. Well, when you, with, with our style, um, with the heavily diffused sources, um, where you can kind of not, you cannot diffuse them enough in a way, like we, we double diffuse everything. <laughs> um, we tend to work with kind of, around T2, but it also depends on the lens, but I light my, I usually light to T2 and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then I'll bring, like if I shoot on the, on the K35s, which I love, uh, then I'll, I'll tend, that lens really works when it's wide open or almost wide open. Like that's the magic is there. So, so then I'll ND, like I always ND the outside, I'll, I'll shoot inside, outside at the same stop, uh, day, night, doesn't matter. I'll bring it, all down to that uh, because I do like soft backgrounds. Um, I don't actually, I can't even like, it's only a few times in my life that I think that a deep stop would do something good. I, I can't even, <laughs> I, I, I'm probably not a purist in that sense at all. Like, I, don't, I don't like deep stops at all. Uh, but, um, and then anamorphic uh, lenses, which we shoot Titans in, we have this, like, it's kind of similar, well, similar lens package. Uh, we uh anamorphic we shoot, right? on two eight. we shoot yeah we shoot on uh on the atlas uh anamorphics and uh we shoot k35s and we also shoot uh on like a sumacrons which i quite like yeah i uh i actually interviewed dan canes the guy who uh mm -hmm. invented the uh, a yeah, cool. few episodes ago they're awesome um, yeah they're they're dope uh that's the one thing shooting those wide open can get dicey but <laughs> i i don't i shoot them in 2a that's like one of those almost a little bit of an old school thing but the the image unless it's intended can get a little softer so so i think 2a is kind of look really optimal there yeah so what uh so you're shooting it at, at a two two and a half but uh what are the lights metering at at at, at that stop like how much energy I, are you I, do, there? I, I i like to that stop oh okay yeah, because because the one thing I've and I don't know if this comes down to coloring or maybe you don't have an answer for this, but there is a look that TV and movies have just a just an extra thing, and I don't it maybe it is just um, you know using an Alexa LF and sick lenses and that, but uh, and set design. But there's just this little extra 10% that I can never put my finger on. Like, why Why does that look different? And my recent theory has been uh, what I was saying, like the contrast ratios and stuff. Like, maybe that's not what we're doing right or whatever. But, uh, yeah, it's just been something I've been thinking. Do you, do you even know what I'm talking about when, you know, the, the difference I do, between... I do. I think ratios in general are crucial. That that differentiates a good cinematographer or a great cinematographer from a good cinematographer. It's, it's all about those ratios, but that background in, 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 in like uh, how how it actually respond or how it correlates with your face right now, and why you know right now your face is much brighter than I would make it compared to that window. Oh, uh, it was brighter when I started. No, no, I know. <laughs> Sun's gone down. Thing in a, in a in a you know in a movie, obviously. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but uh, but that's that's. That that's key, you know, to, to making something believable. And that has to be a feeling. Like you can't you gotta arrive and that's like one of those aha moments. And that's an advanced one because you know, I, I see people light the right way or whatever that means, like something that I can understand. I think they did it, but their ratios were completely off. So, you know, you follow cinematographers and you know, like you give advice. I have some, you know, mentees and stuff like that. And and you know, you give that advice and slowly you see, oh my God, they're just, oh my God, they're getting, and now it's there. And and then they really like take off because they figured out that crucial thing of the ratios, which is, you know, where yeah. you separate the good and the great. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely still like feeling my way through it, but how much um, impact does the colorist now have on what otherwise would have been just like the film stock and, and good lighting. Well, a great deal. I mean, I, I, you know, there are things I don't control on set now. Some, some things I don't, um, there are many things I think it needs to be used. Like I, we try to use it as a tool that enhances something and do something that you couldn't before, you know, like it's 
or you couldn't do it easily. I mean, you know, the ENR technique or whatever, like where you, you put stuff in like detail in the shadow, like a, it's relatively easy to do, but knowing what to do and how much to do and how much to, how does that correspond to what your like your lighting ratios is, is super important. And, and it's not that easy, like this, the colorist cannot, like if, you, if your ratios are not where you want them to be, sure, they can help a little bit, but they can't save all, like you gotta get there, like you gotta actually do it right uh, still. And then they can they can enhance it and make it magical. They can flatten your highlights. They can flatten, you know, I, I'm, I really enjoy, I don't know, I enjoy using polarizers inside. I like the, the flat and dull oh, sure. highlight on the face, you know, we jack faces and dull them to a great so the soft light becomes even softer it's a little bit of an obsessive thing but you know um, it can and it's not like in resolve it's pretty easy you know circle mm -hmm. track and it's like three seconds well it tracks it so well now i mean compared to five years ago it tracks it i i'm like Whew, that that it, that's possible too you know and it's crazy too because like i've had the same computer for five years basically eh, a little little less than that but like you're saying, like it used to take longer and the software's gotten so much better that now I don't have to upgrade my computer as fast because like it just works better now, which wow. is completely the opposite of the way it used to be. Of what, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, I, I, I've really enjoyed calling that. Being a DP now, like at, at my level, is basically like I had to learn to be my own colorist. Lord knows I'm going to fix this now that we've talked about it. Uh, the, <laughs> no, 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 no one's going to see the wrong, the way that this, uh, just random Ari let looks on this thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, like having to learn how to color my own stuff and it was a net benefit too. Cause I can offer that as a service, you know, uh, people, you know, people have me edit things and I can just be like, well, I'm going to make it look pretty too. Um, nice. I'll, uh, we'll let you go. I like to, uh, end every podcast with the same couple questions. Um, the first one being, uh, what's a movie or sorry, uh, first one being, uh, what's a piece of advice that you either heard or read or was given to you that um, stuck with you the most? Not like the most, but just kind of the first one that comes to mind, whether it be cinematography or life, just kind of a, maybe something that's constantly repeated in your head that you've was either given to you or you've read or whatever. Well, there, 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 there are a few. There are a few. Uh, my dad gave me a lot of advice that still sticks with me. Uh, but one, when you were just saying, uh, asking this question, I thought the first thing I thought of is something that a person from this uh, from um, this post house many years ago, as we were doing a short film um, on film on thirty five. We we're all excited about that, and he was a colorist, and he said. You don't kid if you're gonna and he was about to retire and he said uh if you're gonna succeed in this business there's only one thing you need to be and you have to you have to be able to do that and i said what, what is that and he said you gotta be super stubborn and, <laughs> and you know what stubborn uh, is not necessarily the best word for that but you gotta be so persistent and stubborn in the sense of like i'm gonna figure this out i'm gonna do it i'm gonna fail i'm gonna still get up and do it and so, that that's a super super important thing so i don't know if it's stubbornness i think it's more persistence uh in belief in, in what you want to do and what in, in you know in, in cinema and yourself etc uh, i think that's very important yeah and then, then then you become confident and you become all of these things but at first you, like you're not really like you're learning you're like you just want to do it you know and people will try to stop you and you just have to be stubborn and continue you know so that there you go uh second question is uh i know we already talked about dune and i think everyone's just seen do see dune i got to see it in like the dolby like the nice chairs and the whole thing which nice. the movie was just because it's like the nice dolby you know over here at uh there's like a really nice mall over here um and it had the rumble seats the whole oh, film what? was just rumbling the whole film was just, <laughs> just a roller coaster uh but um, what's a film that you think people should see? Doesn't have to be yours. Uh, just any film that you're that maybe recently right now. just like, yeah, just you know, yeah. it maybe one that has cultural significance. Maybe one that's just fun. Huh. Well, I mean, that's a tricky, tricky answer. 
Uh, tricky question, sorry, tricky question, not a tricky answer. Uh, I, I think, I do believe uh, that um, I spoke to somebody recently about Underground, uh, which is Amir Kusritz's film from 1990-something. Uh, uh, and I think everybody should see it because it's a, uh, Amir Kusritz is a, a director who, who makes live action films uh, feel like cartoons because their action is almost impossible. Mm-hmm. And I, I like, like, he's very unique in that. So I'd love for people to, to see. So it's not a recent movie at all. But Dune is definitely like, whoever hasn't seen Dune should see Dune because Dune is extremely special. Yeah. Well, awesome, man. Uh, thank you so much for oh, thank you. the added time. And uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. And uh, hopefully we can thank you. have you You're back awesome. and talk more. Absolutely. Thank you. You're awesome. Good. Excellent question. Awesome. Thanks, man. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. Our theme song is written and performed by Mark Pelly, and the FNR Matbox logo was designed by Nate Truax of Truax Branding Company. You can read or watch the podcast you've just heard by going to ProVideoCoalition.com or YouTube.com slash Owlbot, respectively. And as always, thanks for listening.